Hello, Brianne, Helen, and Robin. Mm -hmm. So good to have you guys here. Thanks so much for your time, your wisdom. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and check, bear with me uh, for a minute. Tera koutou katoa, ko tamara toku ingawa, no o tautahi aho, hei mātanga hapai ao, no rera tena koutou, tena koutou, tena koutou katoa. Yes, trying to do a bit more of that in my life. Um, Beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> I really am delighted to have you, you, you women here because I'm such, I'm going to try not to fangirl, but I'm a big fan of all of you. Um, so to uh and, and obviously we're doing this because it's b corp month so we are basically celebrating b corps um i'm, I'm gonna just probably i mean i wish i could see tish and lucy but we will just get started anyway i think and i'll um introduce you guys uh to start so what i thought i would do is i'll do a little introduce you introduce you um introduction of you and then you could also introduce yourself um and big yourselves up as much as possible <laughs> the uh, way forward so helen i'm gonna start with you co-founder okay. of sustained fun a multi-award winning and I, I want you to give that toy um that you always give about plastic it's just horrific is a multi-award winning new zealand toy company whose mission is to develop children's toys which address climate anxiety and build confidence through play Sustained fun toys are designed to be more fun for longer, minimize waste, encourage a love for the environment, and incorporate STEM. Uh, it was established by Helen Townsend and Anthea Medill in 2021, and Sustained Fun is founded on the environmental principles that are an in integral yeah. parts of their lives. Oh, hey, Tish. Good to um. uh, So, oh, and, and most, um, Helen, I really also want you to tell everyone about whale poo and CO2, if you could. <laughs> Excellent. Good. I like talking about those things. <laughs> um, so kia ora, everyone. Um, thank you for the introduction, Tamara. Um, yes, so a Sustained Fund is the world's first climate change focused toy company. And um, we um, we are here because the toy industry is really bad for the environment, but um, is kind of overlooked and is a, sort of about 10 years behind when it comes to uh, environmental sustainability. So 1% um, uh, of global plastic is used in the toy industry. Um, most toys are made from, like over 90% made from virgin plastic. And they, because they are all combined for toy safety standards they're not recyclable um and also toys shape how kids see the world and interact with the world so they're really important to shape how the next generation is going to interact with the environment so that's why we uh did set up our business and also because it's really fun because we get to make cool stuff <laughs> and um and play with it um and we're also the creators of World Sustainable Toy Day, which is a global campaign to promote yes. sustainability in the toy industry. So remind me what day that is, Helen. What is World Sustainable it is Toy the, Day? It is the this year it's November the fifteenth. So it's the third Friday in November, and that's because it is just before Black Friday, which is a good time to start thinking about how you shop. Nice. Thank you so much. Okay, moving on. So next on my list, um, Tish, I'm going to come to you. Is it okay if I call you Tish or refer to Latisha? Tish, yeah. Tish, gotcha. Um, so Raglan Food Company, uh, a certified B Corp and the first climate positive certified yogurt company in New Zealand. Um, you now are over in 700 stores nationwide and you export, and I understand you've recently launched in New York, so yay you. Uh, you didn't plan to start a food business. You stumbled into it after making coconut yogurt at home to help Seb, your business partner who has dairy allergies. You wanted to eat a dairy-free diet but didn't want to give up yogurt, so they found an alternative. Uh, you offered a couple of jars to Raglan locals, and that grew huge demand, and now you're launching in New York. That seems like quite a big leap. Um, but yeah, amazing. I, I'm a regular buyer of your product, Tess, just so you know. Love it. Anyway, um, yeah, please introduce yourself and like I said, big yourself up. Oh, 
Sorry, you froze there. <laughs> oh, no, Tish, I just said, you give yourself an intro. Cool. Well, you did a pretty thorough job already, but um, good, everyone. Hello, I'm Tish uh, down in Whangarau Raglan. i um, been here for like 12 years and been running the, the yoga business for coming up 10 years, which is crazy to think. I was like 24 when it started. Um, and yeah, started just how Tamara said, completely sort of a bit of a fluke, making yoga, offer it for sale, everyone's keen. And then sort of led to, yeah, sales road trips all around the country with a chili bin and knocking on doors and trying to find buyers and figuring out the supermarket system and learning a lot, making lots of mistakes and then trying to build a whole factory from scratch, which turned out to be quite the mission. Um, so ended up, yeah, buying a bit of land and building the whole thing and putting in all the infrastructure that we needed and growing a team. So we've got um, 30 people now, really awesome little team. Um, one of the largest employers wow. in the town. So it's a small town, surf town of sort of 5,000 people. So it doesn't take um, much to be one of the largest employers. And um, yeah, we're distributing around the country. And um, as Tamara said, just launched in the US. So I'm actually heading over to New York um, in May, from mid-May to mid-July, doing like a full sales hustle. So trying to repeat uh what we did here but over in a new country so um open to tips and ideas from anyone out there who has connections in new york or knows what i should do and do and see while i'm over there um yeah it's been quite an exciting journey and we've tried to do a lot of good along the way and then it's been a big big part of it for us um and just i guess part of our ethos of who we are and being regular hippies nice nice yeah amazing story thanks tish um okay brianne i'm gonna to come to you brianne batik also business but better and now incredibles uh brianne founded and ran the beauty company known as Atik for 10 years another kitchen start um and you grew it to over 100 million dollars in sales raised investment through equity funding angels and private equity and yeah i think it's fair to say you just nailed it slam dunk success um would you like to add anything to that I mean, it makes it sound sort of easy, doesn't it? <laughs> Slam dunk. Yes. Unfortunately, it doesn't work quite Sorry, like that. that. For anyone out there who's having a hard time, it's part of the course. Uh, yeah, so uh, founded much like both of you so far and, and Robin, I know your story to come. Uh, founded it because I wanted to change the world, rid the world of plastic bottles and um, figured that the beauty industry was a good place to start because it was uh, as a biochemist relatively low barrier to entry. Uh, it went well because a lot of people, there's Lucy, um, a lot of people uh, get the idea and I think that's the really important thing to consider in this sort of the business world is people understand why you do what you do and it is much easier to resonate with them on that level. So the company grew well, um, stepped down CEO almost a year ago which people are still learning and now on to the next which is much more exciting. Yeah, it is exciting, your, your new business. I'm the avid listener of your podcast. So, yeah, I'm watching, I'm listening to that journey with uh, interest. Hey, Lucy, good to see you. Hi. Um, Apologies, I had issues. I don't, don't worry about it. Actually, ladies, this is embarrassing. I'm just going to tell my husband to shut up. One second. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Hi, Lucy. I'll, I'll just jump in while uh, Tamara deals to her husband. <laughs> I, I like it in, in the women of impact session. Uh, Tam has to go and tell her husband to shut it. <laughs> and then Tim pops up. Yeah, I'll just go away. Yeah, sorry, thanks, yeah. Tim. Yeah, well, thanks. yeah. okay. It's all, away. Um, it's all going on around here anyway, doesn't it? Right, Lucy, you're next on my list. Um, oh, I need, do I have to be next? Because I need a bit of a. Okay, a no worries. I, I'll go to Robin. It's all good. Okay. I can, no worries. I can, I can no win. Worries. You can't breathe, Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> Feel like I've just sat down. No, I yeah, no I've been sitting for a while. No, no worries. worries. You just okay. You take a moment. Um, Robin McLean, hello. Period. You make sustainable period products like menstrual cups, discs, and underwear. And your goal is to reduce waste by offering alternatives to serious single-use period products like pads and tampons. Man, I wish this stuff had been around back in the day. Anywho, yeah. um, you're a co-founder <laughs> and you're a former journalist, Robin, just like me. Uh, describe. Hang on, no, that's a bad thing. Um, you launched it in 2017 with your business partner and best friend since the age of 11, Mary Bond. 
And as a nurse, it was Mary who designed your first menstrual cup. And the aim is to divert 1 billion single-use products by 2030, based on the maths that one menstrual cup replaces about 2,000 single-use period products. And your vision, this is from the podcast you did with Tim. I don't think it's live yet, but I've listened to it. Um, is that one day soon, the only tampons will be in museums to show how people manage their periods in the olden days. So, yeah, love that. Anyway, Robin, would you like to introduce yourself? Well, again, you've done an amazing job. Um, so, like a lot of the other um, amazing wahine here, um, I think we started the business based on frustration of status quo, lack of innovation in the period care space, lack of discussion around periods in general. Um, crazy given that you know half the world's population has a period for you know up to 40 years of their life, um, and waited for someone else to come out with really great products, and no one did, and so then you have to do it yourself. Um, and so, yeah, we're now the only sustainable period care company in the world that has a product for everyone. So, so we, by that I mean um, we do, as you said, menstrual cups, menstrual discs, as well as specialist cups for different cervix heights, um, period underwear and um, reusable pads and liners. Um, so what we wanted, um, our aim at the start was you know, to not give people an excuse as to why they couldn't make the switch and try them. Um, and so to do that, one of the things that we focused on is making them um, obviously really well designed, um, nice to look at, because that actually encourages purchase, um, and, and actually comfortable and better than the status quo. So all our products hold at least three times more than a regular tampon or pad. So um, it gives gives the user a lot of freedom. Um, mm. Yeah, um, definitely a random um, career pivot for me. <laughs> uh, but it's fun. Yeah, I, I was also very interested. I, it was only after reading some stuff on your website, listening to you, that I realised how many w problems, how many women had problems with these products because they've got different shaped cervixes. Isn't that yeah, and, and again, that's you know part of part of one of my frustrations is that we, because of the lack of conversation. Like for me, for example, I only found out that I had a tilted cervix, like relatively recently after having going and having smears and having really terrible time every time I had a smear. But even the person doing the smear didn't tell me that that's wow. why they were having problems, and that's why I had to have my leg halfway out the wall and blah blah blah. <laughs> so, um, you know. It, it, a, a large part of what we do is just wanting to get people to normalise the conversation to help with the, the sort of stigma um, and, and shame that is still associated with, with periods. Yeah, thanks. Amazing. Lucy, are you ready? <laughs> oh, I'm ready, Tamara. Fair. All right. Lucy Bonetto, founder of Bonetto Natural Foods. And again, a lot of these businesses start on a kitchen table. Lucy is no different. Um, you were a high school teacher of English and drama who just happened to love chocolate. Who doesn't? Um, you made your first chocolate bar from scratch in 2010 on your kitchen bench top with a spice grinder, a box of organic cocoa beans, and a few eager students as taste testers. Um, from there, you've um, traveled to the Dominican Republic to see where the cocoa beans actually came from. And that was for you very early on a deal breaker. You were going to be making sure the cacao growers or the cocoa growers were um, paid fairly um, and that all your ingredients were organic. And you have also uh, just a couple of months ago launched in Europe via Amazon, I think. Just anyway, a, yeah, I, um, yeah you, you go, you go, Lucy. Just an Amazon. Um, so... Uh, so I started, yeah, as Tamara said, in 2010, out of just a passion for good quality food. Um, I, I've I've always um, been an experimenter in the kitchen and dabbled and tried to make things that um, you can buy commercially. You know, um, I'd always try and make them cleaner. And uh, back then in 2010, I made this amazing discovery that the cocoa bean is actually quite healthy. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's what we put in. It's what we put in chocolate that makes it 
not so healthy. Um, so I just got busy and started creating my own forms of chocolate. Um, and this was weirdly at a time where there weren't many people making their own chocolate from bean to bar at that time. Um, around that 2010 to 2015, a lot of uh, a lot of chocolate makers did emerge. It was quite it was quite strange that they all started popping up at once after you know cocoa been around for 2,000 years and all these little small scale chocolate makers started popping up. But um, yeah, I just got experimenting and started making uh, cocoa the way I wanted to, um, sourcing it organically, um, talking to the, finding out more about the people that um, that grew the beans, which was super important to me, especially with my background in teaching. Um, that social aspect was always a key factor. Um, and, um, and yeah, so one thing just led to another and I just got passionate and pretty much every day since Back then in 2010, I was just working at it. There was never a day, even a Sunday, that I didn't just keep experimenting, keep um, keep working, working. And I think that consistency is is really key. Um, and um, and then uh, I was able to, by a fantastic opportunity I got in 2017, I um, was able to to take my tiny little um, little brand of chocolate that really didn't have any impact at all and I met a, a really fantastic manufacturer Swiss manufacturer and I was able to scale up exactly what I was doing um, without compromising on um, on the integrity of the product without compromising on the traceability and having it just perfectly exactly how I wanted it um, and do it to a to scale which was really always the the driver behind it anyway was to to get that impact and to to take something that you know people love and can enjoy daily but creating it in a in a way that is still um uh, not compromised by mass mass uh, manufacturing and corporate sort of um ownership and things like that yeah cool thanks so that's Lucy. A, that makes sense yeah 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 no so a diverse range of businesses all very different all doing amazing things in the world um thank you on behalf of the world so from here um there's so many things we could talk about oh my god and i'm wondering whether we just dive into um some of the juicier kiki blackbird investment disparities for women stuff how political and angry are you ladies feeling or should we um maybe first of all talk about some of the challenges you've faced along the way and these might be specific to being female and they might not be they might be completely different actually um just to one thing i want to start with so i saw this on mary portis's um hashtag fashion fangirl again for mary portis on her uh, linkedin the other day it was a the prophecy she put up so i'm just going to read that it's called the bird of humanity for hundreds of years, the bird of humanity has been flying primarily with one wing, the masculine wing, causing it to become overly muscular, overly developed. In fact, the wing has become violent. In order to keep afloat, causing the bird of humanity to fly in circles and keep repeating the same path of flight. They predict that the 21st century is when the female wing of the bird of humanity will fully extend and allow the male wing to relax. And instead of flying in circles, the bird of humanity will finally begin to soar. So is this the century that the female wing of humanity will start to uh, be able to fly a little bit more? So um, I invite you to either speak to that if you're called or if not tell me just a little bit or tell us a little bit about um a pivotal moment or an experience that has shaped your entrepreneurial journey generally or as a female helen can i start with you ah uh, so, you've been really good <laughs> <laughs> oh um so many things i could say i don't know what I don't know really. <laughs> okay, no worries. It, it, it's, please feel this time. I, I don't know how this is going to work in this setting, but please feel free to have a conversation. If anyone wants to just dive in and say, hang on, I've got something to say about that, please go ahead. 
I found it really hard to like after when when you um, invited me to come on the podcast to know what to say because um, you could get really um, really uh, angry at the statistics, but I don't really find anger is very motivating. Uh, you could ignore the statistics about women and investment in business because we're a panel of of white uh, Pākehā women. We don't have, I'm, I'm not, not, I don't know you all very well, but if we were um, a different section of society, this would be even harder for us. Um, and sure. I don't know if the 21st century is going to be flying with both wings. The Americans would rather have a criminal than a woman as president. Uh, that's not a good sign. No. Mm. Um, on the other hand, there's more and more women running businesses, um, getting into leadership, although the, the, the trials of being in leadership mean that a lot of women leave due to online abuse and mm. challenges of having a family. You, generally, you have to choose. Do you want to be high up in business or do you want to have a family? Like that is a real choice that, that women make, that men don't make. I'm going to stop there. I just <laughs> I love about what I don't know what to say about. <laughs> no, no, no. You keep going. I feel like you're on a roll. <laughs> <laughs> I was so worried about what to say that I thought of lots of things. <laughs> no, those are all really valid points. I think we've all all – thought the same thing and, and and I'm the same it's kind of like sometimes I have to think okay where am I going to choose to be am I going to be over here and really angry raging spitting the world is really screwed or am I going to stay and look at all the amazing women in the big court world and the amazing female founders so I kind of vacillate a little bit between those two uh, places I, d I don't know how anyone couldn't really when when you when you see what's going on but but honestly women like you give me hope and and other oh, women sure. that are in the all, all the female founders there's amazing fem yeah. female founders and certainly the big court movement i just live in that world so that's what i notice but they're doing some amazing really just quietly getting on with it as well that's that's you know just getting on with it that's the yeah, problem quietly getting on with it Yes, mm. I agree, Brianne. Do you think they should be allowed the biggest thing we could do is have more conversations about this, and we only limit it to around International Women's Day by and large. Not true of everybody, of course, but the single biggest thing every single person could do to lessen the gender wage gap and the investment gap and everything else that goes along with it is actually have conversations with it. But the problem is when you have conversations with it about it, I just go and have a look at the comments and some of the YouTube videos I've made the last week about the women investment gap and the... The people who, the, there's, there's many sets of people who have a conversation around it, but you get two comments, two groups, if you like. So there's one who says, uh, well, of course, what do you expect? Women are shit at business. And you know what? Like climate change deniers, get in the bin, not going to bother responding. You're a piece of poo. Yeah. I try not to swear in these environments. But then on the other side, you've got all these, and this is definitely the, the majority, right? You've got all these people who are saying, well, these men, by and large, who are saying things like, well, this isn't true. Obviously, these statistics are biased. This is an incorrect study because if this was the case, then VCs and, and angels and stuff would invest more in women because if women founded businesses were more profitable, they go where the money goes because they don't understand the idea of unconscious bias. And that is because nobody is talking about it because when you talk about it, you get those moronic comments and it's a vicious cycle. So every single person listening, and that especially goes for blokes, you know, people call themselves allies, which I don't really think is something you can anoint yourselves with. But if you are truly about creating a better, more equitable society for everybody, you need to have these conversations and you need to stop tolerating bullshit comments and, and hilarious sexist jokes that are doing a lot more harm than you think they are. Yeah. And it's very brave. Like, I think what you do is very brave, Brian, putting 100%. yourself out there for those comments and putting those videos out there. And it's not particularly fun. Um, and I think I'm mm. definitely more in the, I just do my own thing and ignore everything else. <laughs> like, don't read the news, try and avoid media that's not, because if I go down that rabbit hole, 
then I just get really worked up and end up having rants at my my poor husband <laughs> who hasn't even done anything. <laughs> I, I, don't know. I, I agree. I think that we um, women maybe are a bit more sensitive to those sort of comments and, and there's so many trolls out there that when you see them that, you know, we, I, I mean, I, you know, I carry that sort of stuff. It's, um, and I wish I, I didn't, um, but, you know, I, the, the, the world of social media and the ability for people to hide behind their comments has just become so dangerous. And I think it's mm. particularly hard um, some, sometimes for women because I think we do things better and, and, more brilliantly but I, I think we um I think overall we're also a lot kinder and we do business with a lot more heart um and that that pr presents a challenge when when um you know in that in exactly those sort of situations I agree comments are yeah. Look and at uh, like what she had to deal with just in the you know that's and that's the leader, the leader of the country, and and the, that's all the kind yeah. of hate and horrible, awful, mm. really despicable things that are said. And if you're a little girl in New Zealand and you're thinking about one day becoming prime minister, um, mm. it's pretty off-putting. <laughs> it would it would yeah. put me off running for anything, you know, after witnessing all of that. So, yeah, yeah, and and it is hard, and and I do think people like you, Brian, who are very very vocal and active and and you stand up and because some of us you know just by nature are just not comfortable with doing that and um but those of us that are not so comfortable with doing that are other types you know like um that we just get on and we just have to get on and we just have to do it and we just have to sort of fight a little silent battle on our own and um yeah so yeah, just really grateful that for those of for those of you that are comfortable doing that to get up there and do it and and not be afraid to, you know, to take all the the slander and the the backlash and everything like that. I mean, I just avoid that at any cost. I mean, that's, you know, I just I just don't like it, but it doesn't stop me from doing what I'm doing. Um and yeah, with all this Jacinda thing at the time, I I just really realized that New Zealand is such, you know, there's just such hatred out there unfortunately for, for women in power and it's frightening and it really scares me um but at the same time just you know you just gotta still stay stay true to, to what to what your passions are what you believe in and uh what keeps you going and um even if you're not fighting back it's okay um we'll let others do that for us <laughs> and you hopefully are fighting back do it as well yeah I, yeah I, when i when i say we all need to speak up about it i maintain that mm. and we need to talk about women in business more but just by doing it you are making a huge difference because you are someone that people can look up to and you are someone that other people who are happy enough or stupid enough to go out mm. and say these things more publicly you are someone they can use an example so you are adding to the conversation and becoming a part of it and you are fighting back if you if you want to look at it like that um it does take a certain level of potentially lunacy to constantly subject yourself to silly youtube comments but the other the other um the final bit i want to add to this conversation is it's currently pitched as men versus women and in some regards the way we approach the conversation i have definitely not helped that the idea of women have more profitably run enterprises is inherently an us versus them comment, right? But it's also a comment that immediately deflects the argument that women don't run businesses as well. So it does have a place in the mm. conversation. But we need to move away from that idea of us versus them because that's preventing anybody doing anything. Because I like your bird metaphor. I'm sorry, I can't remember the lady's name who, who wrote it. Um, I like that. I don't necessarily think this is the this is the century that both wings will fly equally because I, I think we're a little bit far off that. But it is something that benefits everybody. If we have equity across all facets, everybody benefits. The problem is yeah. Yeah. when you're the oppressor, right, equity feels like oppression. Is that the yeah. – I'm thinking, paraphrasing badly. Privilege. We need yeah. to move away from the us versus, them. us versus them. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Mm. Um, 
with the statistic Brian, that you wrote about in the um article which is the the art the stuff article about um vc funding which i mean most businesses don't go for vc funding but it's still a, a relevant statistic about how um companies i have that i have that statistic helen just to throw that in there so 1.9 percent <laughs> of all vc investment goes to women so not even two percent goes to women um yet women founders bring in 78 cents for every dollar in investment while men bring in 31 cent for every dollar of investment so, sorry. Yeah, and then is it something like the next a uh, fifteen percent about for companies that have male and female founders? I think. So, uh, Andrew and I have been aware of this statistic since we started Sustain Fund, and we have had more than one conversation that is the best financial choice we could make for our business would be to get a male co-director, because wow. then we would go from two percent to fifteen percent, and that feels like why why should that be why should that be a thing that we've even talked about like if we got a co-director because we wanted another director because of they brought great things to the business then it doesn't matter if they're a, a, a man or a woman but 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 when it comes to like to access more finance we should get a man just to sit next to us <laughs> like just hold up their face that's kind of insulting i feel yeah. <laughs> like a lot. Yeah. Yeah. God. You only had a study which showed that a picture of a guy bloke. Sorry, carry on. No, no, no. Um, the pictures delivered by a bloke are received way more favorably even mm. when than when pitched by a woman. Same word for word pitching, everything else is considered, you know. Well, it's it's a disgrace. It's very insulting. I've, I've been to I've talked to the bank and talked to places and being told I should get mentoring not money I don't need money I need mentoring and, and, and condescending conversations I'm like I feel something this, this conversation doesn't feel right to me and there's more about the, scene, the VC problem it's not a VC mm. problem it's throughout the entire investment mm. ecosystem and there is a reason that equity crowdfunding is as popular as it is with women because women are more successful that route for a variety of reasons mm. so mm. It's very annoying, but any women founders who are listening or have read that, I really don't want to put them off because there are plenty of examples on this call alone of women who have either raised investment yeah. or haven't had to because investment is not a, like a success mm. measure. It isn't, even though it's portrayed as such, right? Um, mm. There are ways around it and there are alternative ways to get funding that do work better for us. And until we fix this by talking about it more, there are, mm. there are options and lifelines. And anybody who tells you shit like that, Helen, you should just walk out of the meeting then and there and say, yeah. we'll see you later. Yeah. I need to yeah. follow Anne for that because she's really fast on, um, she thinks faster and I go away and I think, hang on a second. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, I need to go back and redo that. <laughs> and I have heard the stats are slightly higher for New Zealand. So I think that kind of two yeah. to three percent average that's global but then in new zealand is it something like 18 percent of angel funding yeah that would read that an idea log at some point so it's it's slightly better it's still not amazing um, 18 is because i think a third of businesses in new zealand are run by women so the difference between 18 and a third is a lot more achievable that feels like that it's not the end of the world you know we're mm -hmm. making progress so yeah yeah I'm going to just um, go to a couple of the questions. I don't know if you guys can see those, but uh, mm -hmm. Rebecca has asked, and I was going to come to this issue kind of, look kind of later in the hour, but uh, Rebecca Cox has asked, are there any practices that might help in maintaining that softer mindset in the midst of all this? And, and, and what I was going to ask you guys later was about self-care and looking after your mental health and as well as your physical health, because I also know that physically the stress can create all sorts of issues and problems. Um, so, yeah, how and how do you, I mean, yeah, again, Brianne's view that really takes most of the heat on this. How do you deal with that? How, what do you have any practices or self-care rituals or anything you do to kind of not let it, get to you because I, I know even for me if i hear if i get 10 compliments and one criticism 
often get the 10 compliments and that one criticism, I'll be having to tap on that later, even though they said I am an idiot. Uh, so, yeah, do you have anything on, on that? I, I don't have the answer to this question for you. I don't do anything, uh, but I'm naturally fairly resilient, uh, which I suppose is why I, I keep going back and doing this. Um, but you're right, for every, I'd, I'd go as far as that, a thousand compliments to one insult, right? We, I think we're probably all very much the same. Mm. And I've heard there's some useful things to do, like if you get sent a lovely message on, I don't know, wherever, screenshot it and save it into a folder. And then when you are having a particularly bad day, uh, go in and read them. Um, mm. I keep saying I'm going to do this and I always forget. But it's also, the, it, more than anything, it's the thing for me is remembering uh, what I'm trying to achieve, so being super, it's a corporate term, outcome focused, uh, be aware of I'm trying to, if I look at the sort of the communication work, I am trying to change the world through uh, giving people information that they may not have access to, influencing their decisions, and just provide some more education around stuff that's a little bit vague, right? Um, if when it comes to the business thing, I'm trying to rid the world of plastic bottles. Someone called me a shell for the oil industry this morning, which is hilarious, but anyway. <laughs> so, I, yeah, like, come on, whatever, wow. I'm fine. See, that still bothers me now, right? That's not yeah. even real. It is an insult, but that still bothers me now. So it does, but what I immediately ignore or try and ignore stuff like that and put it away, allow myself to worry about it because if you fight, if you fight your natural feelings, those feelings get more aggressive, right? So one okay. of the most important things to do is this is a horrible comment. It is perfectly natural to feel this way. But I'm not going to feel like this for long and I'm going to get back to, back to focusing on the reason I do this. And the reason is because I believe we can make the world a better place and then we need to. And every now and then it might come back and nag at you. But if you focus on what it is you are trying to achieve and how other people are trying to achieve that with you, you don't feel alone and you feel more motivated. Yeah, I'm always looking at the yeah. goal. And, and also, finding find people is really important too. It's really helped me, I think. Um, yeah. You know, operating, when you start out, it's a very lonely journey. But then if you find some people who um, understand and that you can call or text or whatever um, when you have those bad days and just talk it out and... Um, and yeah, I do think that looking back on those positive comments is also really worthwhile. I always make sure that we still that I still read our customer emails um, because it again, it, yeah, it reminds you of why you started and what you're trying to achieve, and that um, you know I think all of all of these businesses here do have a really positive impact and can change lives and. Um, you know, you can't let the, the trolls derail you um, and, and you can't let them derail your mission. Um, mm. But it is hard sometimes. Mm. But I do think also, you know, just also my one my one thing is when I, if we get an email or someone's been rude, just you have to walk away from it and, and you can't um, react immediately, you know, takes every inch of resilience for me to not to just hit the keyboard and go. But um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you need to feel, I think to survive in business, you need to feel good about yourself and being um, true to yourself and your morals. And, you know, at the end of the day, people can be really nasty or disrespectful, but um you know, that's on them. You know, you don't need to, to go to their level. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what I'd say to all of you is the stuff you're doing is too important to be distracted by these morons. So just, yeah. It's what I find Morals. really helpful. Is, you know, if I'm if I'm having a bit of a, a bad day, and actually I had to check in with myself just probably this morning, to be honest. You know, I, I look back and I go, okay, well, look back and how far you've to how far you've actually come even a year from today you know how much has been achieved in the year and then i just sort of realized that actually yeah it is it is worth worth the fight and also um you know when i get um difficult customers or people writing you know all sorts of nonsense it's just they they're coming at it from a sense of a little bit of ignorance to be honest so i always just um try and explain to them exactly 
how things really are because they 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 don't know. There's a lot that the people out there they don't actually know, so they make a lot of assumptions. Um, I mean, I even I get rude emails about um, carrying the vegan logo um, and then having a disclaimer about may contain dairy. And yeah, I could. That's yeah, I, I get a lot of those actually, and they're quite mean and rude and really saying I'm you know it can make me feel quite downtrodden. Um, and uh, but yeah, but it's just about checking in every now and again and um, and actually realizing what a difference you are making and and the progress that you're making um, mm. and the and how far you've actually come and um, mm. and the difference that you are making and how much you know because because we do nobody knows our own businesses and what we're doing better than ourselves and when people start to you know to um, put us down for that then just have to sort of rest in that place and know that actually. We know we're doing a good thing. <laughs> yeah. And tuning into empathy also helps, or at least I find mm -hmm. that helps me. Like there's that yeah. kind of, I don't know who came up with it, but the hurting people hurt people. And mm -hmm. just that like people who are being morons are being them for a reason. <laughs> Something's happened to them. They've had a bad childhood. That's what I try and remind myself. Like, okay, this person's struggling with all their own stuff. This is not my problem. This is their problem. I'll feel empathy for them and then move on with my life <laughs> and what I'm doing. Um, yeah. yeah Tish, how on earth has someone found something to criticize in coconut yogurt? What kind of <laughs> criticism? Oh, you you'd be surprised. <laughs> I, I, really would be. I really would be. There's plenty of, uh, of angry dairy farmers that have had a few things to say. Oh. <gasps> has anybody ever asked you if you use monkey slave labor? Yes. Yes, yeah, uh, the first time we got that, that email, I was totally baffled, but I bet yeah. you get that. Yeah. But it is oh, a thing, apparently. There is some of that in Thailand, so it's not really, it's not unfounded. Yeah. No, we it have is, to it declare that as well. Yeah. Wow. wow. Someone actually out there using monkeys for, sla for, for slave labor? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Sad. I don't even know how that works. <laughs> it seems wildly impractical as well. Like, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, you know, it's a really the, labor force to work with. <laughs> out of all the potential yeah. employees, uh, I thought of, I never thought of monkeys. <laughs> oh my gee. Okay, that's a new one on me. Um, I'm going to go to another question because Jules has put a couple in, um, and this is this is one of those questions that comes around a lot, but it's quite a nice one to answer. If you could give your 14-year-old self some advice around entering business later in life, what would it be? I'm, I, I think she just means, you know, when you did enter business as opposed to as an old lady. Um, if you could give your 14-year-old self some advice around entering business later in life, what would it be? Uh, Robin, can I start with you? Um, yeah, it's interesting. I, you know, there's there's part of me that wishes I'd started, um, it, you know, that I'd started a business a lot earlier. And then on the flip side, I don't think, um, well, particularly for our business, maybe Brienne, you might be the same. Um, social media, we wouldn't have survived without social media because. Um, you know, our products traditionally were uh, held by two big, you know, corporate giants who can advertise. And, you know, so pre-social media, you had to have these massive budgets um, to be able to succeed, which is why we had so few companies kind of that had these monopolies. And social media allowed us, and a bit like crowdfunding, you know, you found your people who who then promote you and, you um, you know, they become your your sales agents essentially and your ambassadors. Um, so 14 years ago, not wanting to disclose my age overly, but you know, there was no social media. So, um, well, not 14 years ago when I was 14. Um, so, but I think one of the things I always say is if you've got an idea, and this is again, the beauty of um, where we are now, it's actually relatively easy to start a business. So. Um, on not a huge amount of, with no, without a huge amount of money. So if you've got an idea, try it. Um, you know, it's easy to create a website and get some get some feedback and and see whether the idea floats. I mean, you know, it's an absolute ride, and there's there's lots of tears on the pillows sometimes. But um, if you find your 
if you find your thing and you're really passionate about what you do, um, it's so it's so completely satisfying. So I always say, you know, if you do do want to do something and no one else is doing it, or you can do it better, or um, just yeah, just jump in and and learn and talk to people and and also remember that the people that you talk to aren't always right. Um, and you know, this is the challenge with the sort of mentor system, which is amazing, but. Um, we've had some terrible advice from really amazing business people um, and that that would have seen us go under and they thought they knew it all. Um, so I've learnt the hard way to often keep tr stay true to my gut um, and remember also that it's you know that it's our business and, and what we want to achieve might not be what um, someone else wants to achieve or their vision for it. Um, yeah. Nice, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Tish, 14-year-old Tish, what would you tell her? Yeah, I'd just tell her to keep going because I'd already entered business. <laughs> I, was, <laughs> I was buying and selling cell phones on Trade Me as a 12-year-old and then wow. running little bake sales on the side of the road and self-publishing books. And, yeah, I was always yeah. going to be doing this. Um, so I would have just said to my little self, you can do it. You got this. Um, keep going. On mindset right there. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Uh, Lucy, 14 year old you. Um, I would just sell 14, 14 year old Lucy just to get in and get, get well rounded experience in a lot of things. Put yourself out there, build some, build some resilience, you know, experience a lot of different things because yeah, it is tough out there and you, you do need to be resilient and you need to have a diverse sort of range of skills. You've got to be doing lots of different things. You've got to be, you do have to be quite tough and um, quite, um, you know, versatile, really. So don't just limit yourself to just going and studying business. Go out there and, um, you know, learn about other people, learn about life <laughs> and um, build some, get some hard knocks and um, fall a couple of times because you're going to need that experience um, to go into business. And mm -hmm. uh, because it is going to be, it's going to be tough. I'm not going to say it is always going to be tough, but there are going to be times where, you know, I think most of us are going to, could, could say that we probably would have found it tough enough to go, oh my goodness, what am I doing right now? I don't know if you all agree with that. Does everybody agree with that comment? There's, oh, yes been at least one or two times where you've gone what am I doing I, I've yeah I can't keep going but you know you have to be passionate and um and keep going so yes my advice is to get some get some life experience um learn about other people learn about cultures learn and just just get tough <laughs> yeah. thank you yeah. Brienne what would you say to 14 year old Brienne the list would be very long um, and agree with everything these three have said so far, but also um, don't trust people unless they prove themselves to be trustworthy, which sounds real cynical, but I trust people upon immediately meeting them and there is rare exception where that does not bite me in the ass. And the other piece is most advice is absolute trash. And unfortunately that is true from Biscuit Scouts. As someone who mentors people, I feel like I'm, sort of shooting myself in the foot here, but uh, most advice is um, pretty shit and old school business advice is the worst. Yeah, uh, good point. I good made point. a lot of mistakes because I followed shit other people told me that I thought I should do and shouldn't have. Hmm. Mm, thank you. you. Yeah, that old school business advice is a really interesting one because there's a lot of um, people out there who um, claim to, you know, they, they've they've been in business at a time that is not relevant to, to business now. Um, and, you know, times have changed massively. I mean, post-COVID, it's again, it's a whole new new world. But so the people who have maybe run a business when it was just bricks and mortar stores and there was no online, you know, they, in my book, they don't have a huge amount to offer us. <laughs> it's a really good, interesting point. It, I don't know, but it also seems to be changing extremely quickly like i if i end up scrolling on some social media thing i'll even see advice that was told three months ago that was apparently gold star advice then is now not gold star advice i know they were telling you to get your social posts on this many things a day but we don't do it like that now 
So it does seem to change constantly. So yeah, head spinning stuff. Helen, sorry, 14 year old Helen, what would you tell her? Um, well, 14 year old Helen would never in a million years have wanted to run a business. Um, mm. In fact, 30 year old Helen had never thought about <laughs> running a business. So, and then 31 year old Helen did it reluctantly because <laughs> nobody else was doing what I wanted them to do. So I was like, fine, I have to do it myself. Um, and I think that turns out to be okay. Like, I mean, I didn't, I didn't learn any business, so we did it the way that seemed right, which is wrong, wrong apparently. Um, most things we've done are wrong, uh, yet they seem to work. Um, so I think, like, like you don't have to like, I mean, you don't have to go into one career and think you're going to be in that forever, like. And the things you learn at, at school and university, like they might not be directly directly related to running a business, but they uh, definitely indirectly. And there's loads you can learn from, like that you can bring from like any industry to um, to running a business. Mm. Um, I don't know. Maybe I'd tell my 14 year old self to relax a bit more. But on the other hand, your personality is how it is, and that brings you. Like if you're stubborn and competitive, what's the point in telling you to relax? <laughs> like being stubborn and competitive has big advantages and disadvantages. Being relaxed yeah. has advantages and disadvantages. Yeah. So just maybe like just embrace who you who you are. Oh, that sounds like it's on a cushion. Um, I'm going to say it anyway. Like just be who you are and run your business like that. And it's better. I mean. It's easier than pretending to, to be someone else because that doesn't really work very well. Hmm. I was just reading Jackie magazines when I was 14. Haven't given a second thought to anything else later in life. Nah. Um, <laughs> no, me neither. I was just doing, like, just doing sport and having fun. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I would also just like to find a little bit more about, so the next step for each of you. So I, I think I have a well not for all of you all of you but for some of you I, I have a understanding of where i think you're taking your businesses next but it would be really interesting to hear um well, yeah what what's next what are you what are you working on now and and what's the the next big thing um brianne do you want to talk about incredibles i hope it's the next big thing uh yeah I'm a one trick pony, so I'm doing what we did with the teak for the drinks industry, which is obviously a bigger, massive, uh, like 45% of the litter you will find in your typical city street is single use drink bottles, whether it's water or soda or whatever. So Incredibles is um, basically drink concentrate tabs that you drop in a glass of water or a bottle or whatever, and it makes you a drink, whether it's a soda or a flavored water or a cordial. There's going to be lots of different types. So we're hoping to launch sort of June, July, August, September, <laughs> the time 2024, it's supposed to be April. Uh, but as we all know, I'm sure, R&D in a, in a new, in a, in a relatively, well, a very new product in a new category is hard. But yeah, the goal is to um, work with the likes of the Plastic Bank as well, which is a, a it's a, it's a company slash non-profit. So it's a social enterprise, if you like the term, I yeah, uh, that will pay people to pull plastic out of the ocean and ocean-bound plastic, so that's your beach, your beach plastic and, and low-lying landfills, and and pull it back into the recycling stream. So that's going to be sort of a facet of the company to not only give you an option to move away from plastic, but also work to pull plastic, if you like. So yeah, I'm pretty excited. And um, billion-dollar brand is what I'm aiming for, and I can almost say that without a ridiculous, stupid smile of embarrassment, but I'm working on it because I truly believe it is a concept with legs. Yeah. Oh, Brian, so I'm, I'm going to apologize in advance, Brian, but um, but my next question, uh, because I heard on your podcast the other day, I heard you say that you're trying to get used to the, trying to get used mm. to being able to say, I'm a multimillionaire. So, <laughs> it's just, oh, if there's anything I'd love to have to be able to get used to, it's that. How's, how's it going? How's, how's I'm a multimillionaire going? <laughs> Fine. 
Uh, it's really important. I said it earlier and I keep saying it. It's really important for women to showcase their financial success because people regard us as less financially successful and less savvy with money when the opposite is actually statistically true. So it is important for women to do it. But I want other women to do it, not me, because I don't. I, it just. It feels very. Um, it feels braggy and arrogant. And I. I'm working on it. Cool. So next question. Okay, I'll, I'll go to um, Robin. Tell us, tell us where we're taking. Where, where's Hello Period going in the next year, two years, five years? I mean, I just think that we just want to focus on growth, and, and part of you know to do that, there's the education and the answering the why, why question. I mean, I've got when when we first started the business in 2017, my daughter was like, "That's just so mortifying and embarrassing and I'm never going to use your products I'm telling you right now um, and now um, she would never not use our products and all of her friends use our products and so I think for me that's really validating um, so there's less education on that age group so she's now um, 21 um, so that the younger ones that are coming up they are starting their period journey using um, sustainable products um, and reusable products. Um, it's, I guess, and do we need to focus on them? I think so still because they influence their um, children. But, you know, the, the sort of 35 plus who, who have um, used um, single use products all their lives, um, trying to educate them on the, the why and getting them to try something different because the main feedback we get is I wish I'd tried I wish I'd made the switch sooner, which was totally my feedback. Um, you know, I often say when I first tried a menstrual cup, all I felt was pissed off that I hadn't I hadn't tried one years ago and that had, you know, it would have really helped me um, manage my periods. So, um, so yeah, for, for us, the future is just that um, explaining what we do. When we first started, we'd go to trade shows and people would just literally throw our products back in our face and just go, that's disgusting. Wow. Um, and we don't get that now, luckily. Um, but um, there's still just this awareness piece that we need to focus on. And, um, you know, we're, I'm grateful for the, the, the retailers who take us on. So, you know, we're in New Zealand, we're in Chemist Warehouse and Garden Chemist and, and um, Woolworths and, and, you know, that's seeing the mainstreaming of reusable period care, which is so important. So now we've just got to spread that out um, around the world. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Easy. So um, oh, I just, my God, it's 11. Okay, if any of, any of you need to jump off at 11.30, please feel free. Apologies, I'm going to go over. Um, does anyone need to jump off? Because I'll put you next as the... I, I will the, actually have to jump off, yeah. Yeah, no got... problem, no problem. Lu Lucy, tell us about uh, where you're taking your gorgeous chocolate. Yeah, so um, fortunately we're in a, a in a situation where we can expand um, uh, globally because we're manufactured, um, uh, we manufacture to scale and we have secured um, the, good, the good supply. Um, so the sky's the limit, really. Um, uh, which is brilliant, you know, it's great. We, we can have that impact. And uh, despite what you're hearing in the news about Coco, um, yeah, we're going to be, we're going to be okay. So we have just secured um, distributors in Norway, Sweden and Holland, which is great news. I'm excited awesome. about that in the UK as well. So um, we had an Amazon, uh, we did, we have started on just slowly on Amazon testing the waters for the past couple of months and we've just yeah reaching a turning point right now which is really exciting so um fingers crossed in the next couple of months things are, are going to start to to um take off in a different in a, a an all new direction exciting direction um it's yeah it's frightening for me it's a little bit challenging and i'm feeling it now um and we've had a lot of changes in our products to prepare for this and so yeah, it's. Um, I think a lot of the hard work is is going to start paying off very shortly. I'm hoping. Yeah. Oh, good. Well done, Lucy. I hope so. Yeah. yeah. All the best. Thank you. Um, should we say goodbye to you now, Lucy? Because okay, thank you. Goodbye. I do have to go, and I really enjoyed this and seeing you all again, and and it's lovely to see you all. Yeah.
And uh, thank you, Tamara. Yeah, welcome, um, always. And um, yeah. I'll, it was you really and I'll a good conversation. I loved it, actually. So I hope that people out there listening have, have enjoyed it as well. Hi, mm. Liz. Much love to you, Good my day. darling. Bye. See you soon. Bye bye. See you. Um, right, Tish, tell it. I'm, I'm intrigued. New York, coconut yeah. yogurt, New York. Tell us everything. That's, that's where I'm literally heading. Um, before that, though, I just wanted to say, Robin, with what you're doing, it's really cool. And just putting it out there to anyone listening. So we sponsored menstrual cups for all the female um, team members in our team, um, and we give them. To when they start and i feel like that's quite an easy thing that businesses could do um and so and maybe oh, you already start, we've just started a good workplace program so oh, there you go. <laughs> we're really encouraging businesses to so we've 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 been rolling it out and we've got some amazing businesses on board and that's again it's not just them supplying um which is that's amazing that you do that already well done um not just supplying products but also um engaging the conversation with with stuff and again it's part of the normalizing of um of periods and obviously periods in the workplace happen and staff who feel supported and understood are obviously going to um perform better so yeah. it's a no it's a right. no-brainer um and again you know there's a lot of workplaces that provide single-use period products and that's great too because something's better than nothing but we're just encouraging them to um expand expand and you know let their staff decide what they would like to use so yeah yay. i just wanted to give that a little, yeah, little plug in case other workplaces want to do that um and yeah i kind of already said what what's on the horizon i feel like this is all i've been talking about for the last week because it's only been decided in the last week that we're actually going over and, and doing this um, so I'm currently. Can I ask a quick question? How do you get it to New York? Are you manufacturing over oh, we're there? Over there, yeah, oh. yeah. So we've got a production partner in Connecticut. Um, so it's been a really long journey. This has been kind of like four years in the making before we've actually launched anything. <laughs> so um, yeah, and I hadn't originally planned on going for an extended period, but it, yeah, it feels like that's the right thing to do. So I'm gonna head over there and hit the streets um so it's going to be quite fun and i think just yeah the challenge of of doing something in a different market because it's so different everything's new over there they have a whole different system even in how they run the supermarkets and all the different levels you need to go through to get something in a store and um so i'm looking forward to learning all about that and then on a sort of personal level um i've started a charitable trust a couple of years ago and i've put like all the money that I've made so far from the business into it and I'm planning to keep putting everything into that as we go along and so I've got a bunch of projects going on with the it's called the values trust um as well and one of them is supporting female businesses with impact investments so with that um daisy lab nice. which is a precision fermentation startup three female co-founders incredibly smart amazing driven I love them a lot um so i feel i feel like that's something else that's part of this conversation if we ourselves mm -hmm. as women with businesses back women <laughs> um with with what they're doing um that's all part of driving that change nice really good point thanks tish did mean to get to a more solution based discussion didn't quite get there so thanks for that appreciate it um if, and i'm very aware it's after 11 30 so if anyone else does need to jump off like i said please feel free but helen if you don't need to jump off could you tell us what you're doing with whale poo and co2 and other climate friendly toys yeah yes definitely um so this year um my goal is to uh talk more about what we're doing um so anthea and i did realize that you know there's the phrase all hooey and no dewey we realized that we were all dewy and no hooey um so this year i'm trying to be hooey and dewy which makes me sound like a donald duck's nephew but anyway <laughs> um so i am learning to youtube so i uh we're youtubing about um um parenting in the climate crisis because that's a massive um a, worry for a lot of parents a lot of children and young people are really uh, anxious about climate change so we're talking about that we're talking about connecting with nature which is our 
new whale poo and CO2 puzzle, which I'm just going to do a bit of blatant showing here. Very nice. Coming in April. So this is, um, we're doing nature-based solutions to climate change, bringing them into puzzles and toys, um, because when you do a puzzle with your family, you can talk about what, uh, talk about what's happening in the puzzle, which is the whale cycle of how whales and plankton cycle carbon through the ocean in a very non-threatening way. So you can talk about these kind of nature things um, and have climate conversations that are not like face-to-face -face scary. So um, we're doing that. And um, there's a lot of laughing because Anthea and I laugh. Uh, quite a lot when we talk together um, on our YouTube. So please subscribe if you'd like. Look at me plugging. I'm Thank you. Great, great job. Well Thank you. Thank you. And then we will just carry on continuing to change the global toy industry um, as well, which will take longer than this year. But, um, you know, we'll just plug away with that. And yeah. You can have a chat to Nick Mowbray. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe he's, maybe he's on the call. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> yeah, like it's um the big toy companies are um oh thanks Tim, you put up a link. Awesome. Um I feel I've achieved my goal because I told I asked everybody to subscribe, so I've ticked off my march. <laughs> My March um, talking about what we do. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, big toy companies are, are quite um, like any industry, like Robin was saying about um, period products and, and things. Like, they're, they're, industries are run by big companies, and we need to just get in there or small companies together and force them to change. Mm, nice. Nice. All right. Uh, lovely. Yeah. Wahine Mana. I think that means women of power, not to be sure to be honest. It's only been living to her for two months. Um, but um, thank you so much, like from the bottom of my heart. Thank you for who you are and what you are doing in the world. Much appreciated um, on behalf, again, of the world. Um, go forth. I'm sure I'll hopefully connect with you all again. Um, but yeah, just good luck. Like, massively good luck with everything you're doing and um just know that you're very inspiring and fabulous jump out ladies thanks so much yeah.